There he is, just in time. Cause how about you, everybody? We are live. <laughs> Welcome to the Auburn Live Call In Show. I'm your host, Jeffrey Lee, Senior Recruiting Editor for Auburn Live on Three. Today is Sunday, March the seventeenth, twenty twenty four. Lots to talk about this week, this weekend. Recruiting, basketball, recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. They even practice some football. I think plenty to talk about. Want to get to the phone lines tonight as soon as possible? 701-779-9585. Call with your questions, your comments. Here to answer them and address them with me, as always, 79% of the time, Mr. Allen Head and Mr. Cole Pinkston. How about you, fellas? My percentage was about to take a big hit if I didn't make it here right at 630, but oh, we, we are here. Oh, yeah. We were timing you, Cole. We were timing you. I felt it. I felt it. Trending. Trending in the wrong direction. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, today, big news out of uh, the Hardwoods. Auburn secured its second SEC tournament title under Bruce Pearl, I believe. Second SEC conference title. Excuse me. Conference tournament, tournament championship. Tournament, t- tournament title. Yes. And he also has two conference championships as well. So Bruce so is the f- four, four in. Four in. Is this his eighth year? I think. Sounds right. Sounds right. Uh, some other, I mean, uh, Matt AEO5 said he's inarguably the best coach in the SEC. I think you can make an argument for it. I truly do. And that's a, a league of stars, let's be honest. John Calipari, yeah. Nate Oates, Rick Barnes. Do you think you could make an argument for a coach who's won four in three years? Four of the past eight, do you think an argument can be made that just an argument? Well, sure. Absolutely, you can you can make an argument. No, you can't. You don't know <laughs> basketball, Allen Head. According to Matt <laughs> AU05, you can't even make an argument. He's won four of the past eight, four as many as Bruce Pearl has in eight years, but you can't make an argument. That's how uneducated this guy is in basketball. And I body bagged him a couple of times today. I, I, I'm gonna have to give him a how about you on Tuesday because I felt bad. I was just, I was just Daniel son body bagging his ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, Bruce Pearl, they're going to the West Region, I believe. Yes, they. Well, no, they're going to the East Region East, in Washington, but, but they're going to start in Spokane. Okay, so it it it's in quadrants, and our quadrant is going to be in Spokane. In Spokane. First round draw is going to be Yale. If things go chalk, you catch San Diego State. If not, it would be UAB in the second round, which would be an interesting matchup for two teams from the state of Alabama to be meeting in the Pacific Northwest. But should you get outside of that, obviously what looms large is you would have to go to Boston and you would get more than likely UConn. And also, should you win that one, Iowa State. Mm. Quite possibly two of the top six teams in all of college basketball this year, arguably. The, so, the good thing is, if you get past those guys, it's probably going to be an easier road from there on out. I mean, I don't know how much more difficult it can get. I'm going to be right. completely honest with you. I think Auburn got the toughest region, period. You've got, I think, four conference tournament champions in that bracket. UConn is arguably is the top seed and arguably the best team in all of college basketball this year. Iowa State, I believe, won the Big 12 Conference Tournament, and the Big 12 is has the most teams in the actual tournament, so probably the deepest team and excuse me, the deepest conference in all of college basketball, the Big 12. Auburn obviously did what they did in the SEC Conference Tournament and has had a phenomenal year all year long and really is playing its best basketball right now. But just I don't think – I think you have at least four teams you can look at and say they could win the whole thing. Like it, that's – to me, that that region in and of itself – and I don't think you can say that because, look, I'm, I'm – I know I'm going to sound like a homer when I say this, but the way Alabama played in Nashville, I don't look at them as somebody who's able to win that bracket. Like I don't even think – I'm. they're going to be lucky if they get out of the round of 32 the way they're playing right now. The last three games they've played, they got absolutely destroyed by Florida, squeaked by Arkansas, and then got absolutely destroyed by Florida again. 
So it's just, you know, it, it they're not playing their best basketball right now. That's not the trend you want to be on as you move into March. But I feel significantly different about Auburn. It's just a significantly tougher bracket. So we'll see how it all shakes itself out. But if you're going to win a national championship, you're always going to play good teams. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So you're going to have to, you know what I mean? You got to put on your big boy pants. You got to get ready to go. And I am interested to see, you know, obviously the Spokane draw, that travel out there, I don't really love that. But for anybody who knows Bruce, they know he's from Boston, right? You know, that's that's his home. That's where he went to school. He went to school at Boston College. He's originally from the state of Massachusetts. So for him to go back to Massachusetts to play potentially in against UConn, I, I'm interested, man. I'm interested to see how that goes. Him being in his hometown, I, I want to see how that goes. Well, let's see. Uh, before the SEC tournament championship for Auburn, Auburn football hosted a huge recruiting weekend. This was coming off, Cole, a huge commitment. From Tavares, T.J. Dice, huge commitment. Let's talk about that, Cole, as well as Saturday when I think there were close to 200 total. That was family and friends. I think recruit-wise, there was probably 30 to 40. I mean, it was uh, it was big cat worthy, obviously. Um, but uh, your, your thoughts on Tavares Dice getting in the boat as well as Saturday? Huge for Tavares Dice. That's the guy, Alan, you remember we talked about it on, on the recruiting pod. Yep. Who's the guy? And the question was asked. It was a good question. Who's the guy that can get momentum back in Auburn recruiting? Who's the one that you really need to go ahead and get in the boat? The two guys we said were Tavares Dice and Eric Winters. And guess who else was at Auburn Saturday? Eric Winters. So, really, I mean, most of the guys that are just massive, massive targets, minus a few of them, were at Auburn Saturday. You got those guys there. It was huge, man, huge. But I love um, Dice. To me, he, he rose to the top of my uh, my ranking for this class that I that I do on the side of. Obviously, we have the on three ranking, but I like to do a ranking just to show you what I think about the guys. And I have Tavares Dice number one, Jordan Crawford number two, and honestly, those two going to be battling it out um, for that spot all year. Uh, I just think he's that's the guy you had to get. And they closed the door on it. That's that's the term I gave it uh, on, on the corner. They closed the door on Florida State. They closed the door on some of these other schools involved that had some momentum starting to try to pull away from Auburn. And Auburn wasn't going to let that happen. And that's what's most important to me. Zach, I'm, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Is, is no, Zach, I'm, you got some people lined up. Yeah, we got three callers. Okay. Before we do, I see that now. Uh, personal question of the week, the POW, the queue was silent. Somebody asked about cutting grass, man. It's, it's, it's getting big grass cutting season. I did that today. Did you bag your batch? Absolutely. Your batch. Absolutely not. Yeah. You're I clipping. mulch it, man. Yeah, no, dude. I, I spread the seed and then just go back over it, man, and mix it all in, baby. Yeah, God, I, I think it would take me with it would take me about a whole day if I bagged it. There's no way. Can't no, dude. Uh, yeah, I'm, it, it is not. Look, I can easily run back over that a couple times, spread all that extra around, and, and so long as you know what you're doing on a riding lawnmower, and you know how to you kind of start, you know, one way and then cut it back the other way, so you're not just cutting on top of yourself. Right on. You know what I mean? It, it, it's not rocket surgery. You know what I mean? Like just, just make it look nice. It's it's about to be grass cutting season. It's my favorite season of the year, summer. And uh, I'm tell you, I ain't gonna be able to cut grass for a month with how much it's rained. It's mm. not gonna. I got I got my lawnmower yeah. stuck last year. Had to get a truck pull it out. We're not gonna do that again. You got you got some hill action there, Cole. It's gonna be a minute. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got a little slope out there. Okay. Um, all right, let's see. I, I think it's gonna depend on the yard size. I think yeah, it does. People, people it in a cookie cutter neighborhood are going to probably bag the front at least. Now, sure. When I lived when I lived in the neighborhood, I did. I I yeah, always did. I think it was in the HOA actually when I lived there. Like you can't not bag the grass. And I wonder when I was growing up, we had oh man, my dad. I don't know. He got like a new John Deere riding lawnmower with the twin bags on the back, dude. It was yeah. fancy, dude. We was big yeah. time. 
and you fill that some bitch up, and you got to go dump them somewhere, right? Yeah, yes. we had to, so you got to have you know you had your clippers pile. So such a pain to me. I, I'd rather it, just did you, you got, bur- did you burn them after you got done? No, we had a hole. We okay. had a hole back. We had a we had a little half acre lot in the back. We took it down to the hole and just dumped it. Okay. So and I'm guessing a lot of people don't have that <clears throat> somewhere to dump these. So I'm wondering what they do with them if they do bag it. I, I know they, they bag them in a garbage bag and put them on the curb and the city picks them up. Some people do. Uh, it, yeah. Again, it depends on the neighborhood. I lived a little pushed out to the country, so I just light a little fire in the backyard, man. It's, and it's, done with. it's all going to depend on where you live. Yeah, it does. All right. All right fair enough. All right, Zach, get us there, big dog. 9413. Oh, You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Hello, gentlemen. This is this Stan? Can you hear me? Oh, Stan from Cleveland. Yes, sir. All right. What's on your mind tonight, Stan? Yeah. Well, first, I, first I want to defend my honor. <laughs> okay. Go for it, Stan. What you got? All right. It's because I mean Jeffrey Lee was talking about me sleeping with socks on. <laughs> <laughs> and even AJ Head had to jump in on it Wednesday and say, "Yeah, I took a shower with him on." I I did. So and I so I said something to my ex wife about it, and she said, "You mean to tell me you sleep with your socks on?" I thought I was gonna get a friend, but I didn't. <laughs> Stan, we were just picking at you, man. All in good fun. I promise, brother. We love you all the same. That's all right, buddy. I I know sun don't shine on the same dog's ass all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I just I, I really I had a, a quick story to tell you if if I can. Sure. About Auburn fans. I mean about Alabama fans and Michigan fans and then Ohio State fans. Go for it, Stan. All right. I was at the big house one year. And I'm sitting there with my date and another couple. And I got my Michigan jersey on. Well, in walks this Ohio State guy. He's got on pants, I mean, pants, jersey, socks. He's got on one of those uh, wool hats like a toboggan with the black eyes all over it. And he starts on me day one, you know, telling me that, you know, how bad Ohio State was going to beat Michigan and all that kind of stuff. When I moved up here 40 years ago, it took me about five minutes to decide that I was going to be a Michigan fan. Because Ohio State fans, if you believe it or not, are worse than Alabama fans. So he starts on me, and Michigan's losing like probably – 50 to nothing. You know, and it was normal. I can't remember who Rich Rod was a coach, who's a coach. So anyway, I kind of got tired of it about after the second quarter. So I leaned over and I asked him, I said, how's your grandma doing? And he turns around and he looks at me like, what? So yeah, how, how's your grandma look doing? And I kind of gave him the look and the nod. It upset him so bad. He didn't say anything for the rest of the ball game. So I did that, and then I poached him, and I said, "You know that Nana was a freak." <laughs> that was the only way in the world I could shut him up. <laughs> So yeah, freaking out. You complaining about Alabama fans? Just think about how bad Ohio State fans. Well, I got to hit it both ways. I don't but envy your position, that, Stan. Have a good night. Appreciate you, Stan. You're muted, Jeffrey. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> uh, 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 that was a great story. Um, <laughs> I actually enjoyed it. I, I, I did. Particularly the in line. Stan's ex didn't know he wore socks in the bed. Maybe that's why she's his ex. 
<laughs> We're gonna just keep just keeping it real. Oh, by the way, before we go to the next caller, if you're in Auburn, Opelika, Lee County, looking for a house, need to sell yours, need some help, look no further for the help you need. Right here, Jessica Angels with the Talents Group. She is a five star realtor, according to Mr. Allen Head. If you don't believe me, just ask him. Uh, give her a call, 334-704-4442. She is fantastic. We'll go above and beyond what a typical realtor will, will do. I know this because I've uh, experienced it both sides. Give her a call, Jessica Angus with the Talents Group, 334-704-4442. Tell her we sent you. Okay, Zach. We got K Kevin from Wilmer on the line. Kevin, you're live. Kevin from Wilmer, Alabama. What's up, Kevin? Big dog, MVP of last week's show, Kevin. Yeah. I got you a quick, a good question to answer my question. I All like right. it. What you got? How many touchdowns Brock Kane will have? Okay. That, that'll make us think. That'll get us talking. That'll get us talking. That'll get us... Uh, first of all, we've got to assume that Bryce Kane will be playing as a true freshman, and I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Do, 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 uh, let me ask you, do you, for the, for the panel here, do you expect Bryce Kane to play enough as a true freshman Yep. I think I like. I think I like what I've heard at this point, mm -hmm. but I've got to see how the rest of spring plays out, and then fall camp. It's too early for me to make that assessment, given that we have a plethora of slot guys. Yeah, it's a little bit different with Cam Coleman because you don't have those outside bodies that you really need, and so you're kind of banking on that one. Whereas with slot, you've got several bodies that can play that position. Robert Lewis, who'd gotten good reviews on uh, the transfer uh, from Cal, Sam Jackson. You've heard some complimentary things. Jay Fair is returning. He had a had a pretty decent year last fall. Uh, Caleb Burton could also play inside on the slot, except he's – I mean, I think predominantly he's played on the outside so far in fall. Oh, camp. really? To my understanding, I think spring. he's – Yeah, in the spring he's he's played predominantly at the Z, is to the best of my understanding. But uh, he, he, a lot of bodies you can throw into that position, and then you'll also be competing against another freshman in Malcolm Simmons who could also play that spot. So – a lot of different guys you can rotate in there. Cole, what do you think? Well, you know, one of the things I love about a big – and I'm calling it mini big cat. I think I turn, I, I put that phrase in one of the stories I've written so far. We're calling it mini mini big big cat. It was awesome, dude. There were so many guys there. I, I love those settings because you get to actually, instead of just interview the players, you're, you're kind of – they'll you know, you can talk to them a little bit because it's more of a laid-back setting. Cortez Mills, who y'all should start getting familiar with, is a wide receiver target from South Florida. He was there. He started talking to us a little bit, and he said, that number, uh, you know, that Cam Coleman and the other freshmen, they're going to play, dude. I said, that's, that's, they're going to play. I said, that's one of the big things for me in my recruitment because they're going to play. And it wasn't just because he saw them. It's because he was told that by a coach. And to me, you can get some really good intel from these recruits because they're telling you. I mean, yeah, they're gonna they got to pitch things, but at the same time, if they know it's early playing time, then then that's they're gonna tell them. I think this guy's gonna play a lot. I think this guy's gonna play a lot, and you learn a little bit. So, I that's the intel I got from Cortez Mills. I think that Bryce Kane will play. I'll say two touchdowns is my answer to Kevin's question. Okay. Oh, so, so I was going to put the over and under at one and a half. Over. I'll take two. Okay. I'll take over. Okay. <sighs> Man, here, <clears throat> it's going to have to be in probably non-conference game. Look, <clears throat> yes. I just I, I've I've seen Robert. I'm, I've heard enough about Robert Lewis to know, and, and Jay uh, Fair. I'm not. I don't know if where he stands with that, but Robert Lewis has been talked about yeah. as much or more than anyone since I've been snooping around. And, I, you know, not snooping, but just talking to people, being up there, Cole, being up yeah. there on Saturday. You're able to talk to several different players, coaches, yeah. all you know, recruits. 
And uh, Robert Lewis was continues to be one of the names that pops up very early. So, yep. but I'm not putting the putting it out of reach that he doesn't send in Bryce Kane when Auburn's up, you know, 38 to nothing over, you know, Alabama A and M or whatever. Of course, and then it does Bryce Kane surpass Jay Fair? That's what we also yeah. don't know because if he passes him in the two deep, I would absolutely take the over because then he's in your top six wide receivers rotating through. Right. If he doesn't, I'm with you. It's going to depend on how to, you know, do we feature the passing game when you get up in your non-con schedule? Do they let them air it out or do they try to run the clock out? I mean, I think we've seen it both ways within the last couple of years of what they've tried to do as far as, I mean, I think in the Sanford game, they worked really hard on getting guys some work. And then on other games like the UMass game, they just grinded it out there at the very end and really didn't let Holden Garner air it out much at all. So, It'll all depend on where he is on the depth chart. I'm going to go under for the time being. Me too. But Just for the time. For the time being, but that's TBD. Kevin, right. ask us again when we get into fall camp and we know a little bit better about where everybody's standing. Uh, hey, let me let me see that eight day on April 6th. There you go. Let me see some rotations. Let me see let me, let me see some some action in front of myself, in front of my own eyes. And, hell, who knows what comes – two days come around. Uh, we might be jacking up the over and under three and a half. But, again, remember, true freshman at Auburn – you know, we talked about the statistics before. It's tough. Traditionally, historically, at Auburn, true freshman, what was the records we were talking about last week? I think the uh, touchdowns was Ronnie Daniels, and he was, you know, 35 years old. So Conservatively 35. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that. But I'll take under for now. I'll take under for now. Good stuff, though, Kevin. Appreciate you, big dog. I believe we got Anthony here. Anthony, you're live. Hello, fellas. That's from Montgomery. What's up, big dog? What's up, Anthony? How y'all doing? Y'all doing all right tonight? Yes, sir. Really well, man. How about yourself? Hey, quick. Two, pretty good. Pretty good. Good. Quick two questions. First question. Um, We all had Laquan Robinson penciled in after Star Safety, but have you guys heard anything about him? Because I just feel like I, nobody's really talking about him. I haven't heard him mentioned at all since he got the Auburn River. And second part, um, any surprise names you guys hearing in the early part of spring? That you know, under the radar, just having a good early part of the uh, spring camp. That's all I got. Okay, I like it, uh, but I think he's right. But it's it's just that people aren't as bad as it sounds. People aren't like when when you're asking about you want to know like what the offense is doing, the quarterbacks, the uh, you know what I mean, the wide receivers, yeah, the young guys. Yeah. I will say this, and Cole, I think you need to jump in here because you've been around practice more than I have. Caleb Wooden, A, has been with the starting group, and I think that's surprising to some people. Uh, But when you think about somebody that's been in the system for two years, has kind of an understanding of concepts, and has been playing in the SEC, it's not that far-fetched that he would be in the starting group. And two, Laquan Robinson's really going to be able to separate himself when they start full contact. You know what I mean? Like he, he, Yeah, he's the kind of guy – that when he gets an opportunity to put full pads on and come downhill at you, that's when you're going to know he's there. But Cole, what do you think? You, like I said, you've been there. Yeah, I mean, I've I've sat, I've stayed over there with the safeties group and watched them go through things. Looks like the three top dogs over there to me, and and you can kind of tell that by who's leading drills and who looks like, you know, they're they're the guys. And to me, it looks like Laquan, Jaron Thompson, and. Uh, I'd even put Caleb Wooden in there, but the other one I was thinking was Terrence Love. Yeah. Those are, those are the three guys I think are probably your leaders in the clubhouse at safety. I do find it interesting that we got to talk to Hugh Freeze um, Saturday briefly. He was asked yeah. about young guys and um, incoming transfers. First name out of his mouth was Jaron Thompson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It sure was. Second name out of his mouth was Caleb Harris. Sure was. And uh, then, of course, he was like, I don't want to get to naming names too much because I'll forget somebody, which is, yeah, it's understandable. But it is interesting that that's where his mind went. Uh, It went to the DBs. And when I'm watching them at practice, the DBs stand out a little bit athletically. Uh, I don't see – I mean, I see about 10 to 12 guys in that group combining safeties and corners that I go, they can play. They could actually contribute and be good, play significantly. So that might be one of the top rooms. We'll see. Experience is going to be a problem, but 
there's going to be a lot of swapping, switching. I want to say this, though. With spring, guys, you got to remember, it's spring. This is a weird time of year because you get all, a little hyped about football, but it's really not a great representation of what the team is going to be unless you got most of your team, and I think Auburn does. That's why it's a little different this year. But, I mean, I was going through pictures, trying to find a good picture for an article the other day. I saw Desmond Tisdall. Jeffrey Emba, guys, I was like, wow, I forgot those guys were with Auburn last spring. Jeffrey they transferred. Emma, wow. So, just wait. There's going to be some more changes. And no, whoever's, whoever's looking like the starter right now, I wouldn't put too much into that. No, I don't disagree with you, especially with the new defensive scheme being put into place and a new safeties coach. Because yeah, my guess is Charles Kelly is going to want to see what these guys do in fall camp. He's not looking to make starters come out of spring tra- spring training. He's just trying to get concepts across and make sure people understand the playbook, where to be, how to play fast. But I tell you this, I, I did see some clips of Terrence Love and Caleb Harris. I'm going to be shy, guys, if those aren't linebackers by the time they graduate from Auburn. I mean, those are big guys. I mean, at least, really big to be safeties. At least the guy that you walk up as your nickel or maybe call it like a star or joker or something, that hybrid. Right. Which, by the way, since we're talking about that, Eric Winters. Mm. Eric Winters is not a linebacker for Auburn anymore. He's a safety. And he was with Charles Kelly a lot. He was one of the last guys that left from the whole thing with Charles Kelly all the way to the end. Uh, of course, Josh Aldridge and he and he and Winters have a good relationship. So they were together too, but it's Kelly, I think, is sort of spearheading this thing now. Went out to eat with Kelly later, you know, all this stuff. So safety, Eric Winters. And does that help Auburn? Maybe. I think it does. And privately, I think we've been talking for a while now uh, amongst ourselves. Is Eric Winters, what board is he on? Because we were a little bit confused yeah. of, of where he was going to be placed. Uh, but it was good to hear it from him that it's going to be safety. And I think you feel got to feel, Jeffrey, I don't know how you feel. This is really your field. But you feel a little bit better knowing that Charles Kelly is going to be his main communicator moving forward. Like I, I think that gives you some confidence. You're going to be able to pull that one in. An in-state guy. <clears throat> well, Charles Kelly's got those in-state roads. Yes. It's, and he's it's, a fantastic recruiter. I'm sorry. Cole Hickel. I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off. It's the relationship. If anybody knows Charles Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> right, go ahead. It's the relationship with Aldridge in the first place. Now you're adding Charles Kelly to the mix. That gives you some confidence. Like, wow, we've seen what Josh Aldridge can do. We know what Charles Kelly's done elsewhere. You you combine those two in a recruitment. And, hey, Hugh Freeze is involved too. And Auburn doesn't want to lose this guy. You add that to the mix. I know what you might hear about Georgia. I'm, I'm still – I'm still rocking with my Eric Winters to Auburn pick. He's the Joe Phillips of 2025. It seems that way, doesn't it? Kind of does. I mean, gun yeah. to the head. I'm, I'm taking Auburn on this kid. I am. It feels am. like him and Alvin Henderson both have moved into that point where Auburn's not going to let them go out of state. And I would say yeah. that it, it's not the team across the state that you're worried about with either one of those two guys. With Alvin, to me, it's Florida State and Miami. Those are the two. That was my information that it was – I know he put Penn State and Oregon also in there. No. Not even really a consideration in my opinion. It's those three. And I don't think – you. I think Hugh Freeze is not willing to concede Alvin Henderson at this point. I believe he's going to push to get him in this class. I feel the same way with Eric Winters, who's also got – what was it, Georgia, Tennessee, Florida State also in the mix for him with those the other three teams. Sounds right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Miami. I can't remember who the other team was. That's those are the main ones, I think. What, what, what was Anthony's second question? Any freshmen standing out? Was that it? Oh, okay. It was anybody, period, that you know, under the radar that's kind of standing out that you guys have heard about. And Champ Robert Robert, Lu- Robert Lewis was mine. That, that's the one I had heard, same as you, Jeffrey. Robert Lewis is a good pick. If if you're doing offense and defense, I give you Champ Champ Anthony on the other side. I think he's gonna Ooh. play. Okay. And uh, maybe, maybe DJ Reed. Maybe this is his time. Deron Reed. We'll see. Y'all know I'm high on him. I, I hope it works out. I hope he's that guy. Um, I still, I'll, I'll stand strong on saying I, I, it would make me feel better. I don't know what they think exactly. It would make me feel better if Auburn picked up another one or two guys for the interior D line out of the portal after spring. 
All right, Zach, what you got, big dog? Six six. Let's let's see. Six six five three. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Dylan from Tampa. Oh, Dylan from Tampa. How about you, big dog? What's on your mind tonight, Dylan? Well, uh, watching Auburn basketball, I I, I had an epiphany uh, mm-hmm. that Auburn winning games is is pretty enjoyable. Uh, I like winning. That's a <laughs> that's a pretty good feeling. Novel concept, it right? Me, yeah. It, it got me thinking about Auburn football, and I was like, man, what do we have to do uh, to just get a season we're proud of, see some progress, uh, and and maybe maybe not contend for a, a championship this coming year, but maybe a overachieve and so i uh i got to thinking and, and i kind of came up with uh kind of the three factors that i i wonder how far would get us and i want to get you guys' opinion uh if if peyton thorne is top half of the sec we can go into the transfer portal and get a similar talent to marcus harris and we have at least one receiver go over 700 yards how far do you think that takes us this year in this season uh, over that seven win that you guys originally thought that we would come in at. What do you think is the absolute ceiling for this team? Everything goes their way. I mean, nine. Talk, I, I, that's, where that's where I am. Absolute ceiling is nine, floor is six. The team I'm looking at right now at spring, I think the ceiling's nine. You add a couple pieces, like like Dylan just said, like a, another Marcus Harris type defensive lineman. Uh, Silly Kite. Right. Somebody else, I, I might push it to 10. Because you got to remember this, and I know I'm a broken record on this. How do you explain, scientifically, <laughs> how do you explain the roster that Georgia has, the roster that Bama has, but somehow Auburn's a play away from winning those games? How do you explain that? I don't know how. But there's got to be something to it, I think. I think there's got to be something to it. I think, for whatever reason, they're in those games. If you add more players to the mix that can help you, can they get over the hump? That makes logical sense to me. But I don't know. Not much about college football is logical anymore. Well, and in that same vein of the argument you just made, how is Auburn one play away from beating Alabama and Georgia – how does that same team lose to New Mexico State? Exactly. That's and I was – That's the kicker there. Right. Is the inconsistency with which this team played last year. And that's typical of first-year teams when you're in a rebuild. And that is exactly what Auburn was. I mean, hell, it was a teardown. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's, let's be honest here from a talent level standpoint. I think the number one thing – you mentioned Bruce and his rise at Auburn. Patience is going to be needed. And that's not something that Auburn football fans are necessarily good at being as patient. It took Bruce three years to lay the groundwork to get Auburn basketball to where it needs to be. I mean, I think his third year, he won 18 games. And before that, I mean, he was 12, 13, I think maybe 15 games if you count the SEC tournament when they went on that run. But it took a while to get his guys in here to be able to do what he needed to do, run that flex cut offense, understand how to compete at the SEC level. Hugh Freeze is on more of an expedited timetable. And that's just the way it works now, right? Like if you don't, if you're not successful, like trending in a winning direction by year two, you're automatically on the hot seat with a lot of fans. And to me, that's kind of unfair for a guy like Hugh Freeze who walked into a program that was as talent deficient as Auburn was when he got there. I mean, and truly talent deficient. I'm not trying to stump for anybody here. I'm being completely honest with what I saw on tape. I mean, Cole and I both were on record as saying, hey, we were a notch above Andy, but not much. You know what I mean? Well, like, to be fair, we said that before Freeze ever arrived. We were saying yeah. that. They weren't yeah. where they had to be, and that's why Brian Harson got fired. It's not like a mystery or or like we're we're gunning for Freeze or anything by saying that. That's just the truth, dude. You know? 100% the truth. So I would say patience and realistic expectations by the fan base. So if your expectation this year is 7 and 5, 8 and 4, to me, that's realistic. That is doable underneath this staff. Sure. Uh, another top 12, top 10 type recruiting class, that's doable. And then the next year, the expectation changes again. But if the expectation is, is that Free should come in there and he should be winning 10 games in year two, to me, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, and I'm not trying to talk down to any Auburn fans. I understand the aggravation and the irritation 
by the fan base because they just want to win. It's been four seasons of mediocrity, and they're tired of looking across the state at a team that's consistently playing for SEC championships. But it's a process. It's a build. And you just have to be patient with that and understand where you are. Not put too many expectations just because you're frustrated. Understand this is a new coaching staff. He has zero to do with what happened underneath the Brian Harson regime, period. Yeah. He has zero to do with what happened underneath Gus's last couple of years. This is a brand new coaching staff. The slate should have been wiped clean when he stepped on campus. For Auburn fans, that's hard to understand or it, for them to it even to be palatable, right? But Jeffrey, how do you feel? What? Did you get lost, man? I'm working on something over here. Are you working on something? What, what were you talking about? <laughs> what I, what's it going to take for Auburn to have a winning record next year? Like to have a really good winning season. I was talking about I think Cole and I, Cole was there. Um, I don't know who I was talking to, but man on paper, I love this offense. I do, yeah. except the inconsistent. Find a quarterback that's going to be consistent, give you some consistent play, leadership, can read the defenses. And I think Auburn has that. I don't know who it is, but I think there's somebody on this team. I think there's somebody in that quarterback room that can give them that. Offensively, I think this team can score points. I do. Uh, I'm with Cole on the defense, and and he's not alone in thinking that. Guys that know much more about it than me and him do are saying the same thing. Yeah. Uh, got to have help on that defensive line. Got to have help. Got to have somebody step up in that defensive backfield. Uh, I, I do. I, I think this team is capable of surprising some folks. I, I think this team is capable with the right addition or two in the offseason. I don't think they need a huge I – th- I don't think they need, you know, ten guys. I think they will have the numbers to add five to eight yeah. in, out Which of the portal. Is, that's that's got, good. Yeah. That's what you need. All right. They got I, the numbers I, to add five right now. So much but, less if you have any attrition. But immediate contributors, two, three, yeah, m- maybe. That so would be about, I, I about the same as last year that you got after spring. So I don't, I don't, I don't think it, you know you need a total overhaul between now and the fall, or, or, or you know you're looking for a got to have this guy. I think it would be beneficial. I think it could help, uh, especially on the defensive front. I think you got to have that guy. I do. I agree because I, I just don't like the girth of the size of some of the defensive linemen that you've got. I like them. I think they're really good rotational pieces, but I think you need a bigger body in there, man. Like I just, I do not love what we got at the three tech spot right now. I yeah. just don't feel confident in it. I was um, to, to um, the original question from, from Dylan, what's it going to take my, my mind? I think you nailed it, Alan. My mind went to leave freeze alone because what I'm watching from a recruiting reporter standpoint is it has a chance to be magic <laughs> on the field, I'm telling you. It's a night and day change from what I had to cover my first year as a recruiting reporter. So I say you leave him alone. Let's see what these guys are, are, are about that he's bringing in. And I already like a lot of the positions. They look good for the future on the current roster. I say leave him alone. That would be my answer to that first question that Dylan asked. Hey, and piggybacking off of that, Cole, not only the players, but these 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 new coaching additions, I love them. I do, man. It, it, it's hard not to find – I mean, besides Jeremy Garrett and Vontrell Williams, I, first of all, I love Vontrell Williams. I think he's fantastic. Right. I think, I think he's a fan – I think he's going to be fantastic. Kids love him. Players love him. I, give him, I'm some, give so him some time. Worried. I'm not so much worried about him as a recruiter after watching him a little bit. I think no. he'll be fine. He's fantastic. And, and, and it's going to take a minute. Sure. Because – because there's a time. there's a change there, and that's part of it. But he, he's going to be fine, and he's new. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, take, I'm not talking about years. I'm talking about months. Give right. him time. Come back to me in December, and let me know your complaints on him. And and, and if if they're warranted, they're justified. I'll be the first to admit it. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. Yeah, I don't. He was a he was a big big part in Jeremy Garrett's success recruiting in Auburn. Yes, he really was. Yeah, he was. So. But but the other additions, even the off season, I love this team. I love the uh, the players. I love the staff, the chemistry. I love the new additions off the field and on the field. I think it, I think it's fantastic, man. I, I think I, I think this team can can surprise some people. Let's put it that way. I mean, that's not going. That's not a hot take going out on a limb or anything. But I think there's 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 some potential here. Yeah. There's some potential. When I say potential, potential to get to that nine game ceiling. 
I, th- I think Auburn has potential to get to a nine game, nine win season. I agree. It, I, I honestly think you are probably closer to winning seven than you are nine. But I think sure, those seven, I think those seven are going to look better this year. Like I mean, they were that was an ugly six last year, right? It was I mean, the, awful. Let's let's be honest here. Having to beat Mississippi State, Vanderbilt, and the most pitiful Arkansas team I have ever witnessed in my entire life. That, that was an ugly six you had to get. And then that Cal game. Woo, painful. 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 They, they, I mean, it was painful offensively to watch. I think this side of the ball, the offensive side of the ball, is going to look significantly better. But I'm with you guys on the defensive side. Can you add another couple pieces up front so that you feel better about some of these matchups and not having to play young guys are going to wear down on the back half of the season. I think they could hold up okay for the season to start, but the strain of a season on a lot of young, young bodies, I think you saw that with Keldrick Falk somewhere. He just wore down some a little bit sure. last year. So you got to have some rotational pieces to mix in there with some of these other guys. Yeah. That's good stuff. Good. from Dylan. Very good stuff from Dylan. Yeah. <clears throat> six, six, nine, four, zero. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Alex from Mocha. I was just calling because I had a few questions. I was wondering if uh, y'all heard anything else about Demarcus Riddick because I haven't really heard nothing else about him since bowl season. And then uh, Cameron Brown, I seen a video of him on the, the I guess it was the football Twitter page. Yeah. He went up and caught one, and it looked good. And I was wondering if y'all thought he was actually going to take the step forward this year. And the last one, kind of off topic, who y'all who y'all got to win it all in basketball? That's all. Okay. All right. Cole, take, take that to Riddick because Cole was telling me this did Saturday. You, did you write those down, Jeffrey? To Marcus yep. Riddick, Camden Brown, and okay. basketball. All right. So, yeah, Riddick, um, I, you know, I haven't heard uh, just a ton of buzz about him. I think he was, you know, had a small little deal he was dealing with on, on his leg, but he's fine. He's been at practice and all that. No, no non-contact or anything like that. But, um, uh, the one thing I have to remind myself of, of this is those guys are high school guys. They're, they would still be in high school if it was a normal, you know, if it was how it used to be, they'd still be in high school, go to prom. Yeah. And they're, yeah they ain't learning plays and <laughs> doing all that, going through practice. But athletically, I don't think you're going to find a more athletic linebacker than DeMarcus Riddick. That guy is just different when it comes to that. And, um, uh, Look, all the linebackers, linebackers are a tough position to learn early. It's tough. There's a lot of things because you, you're you're teaching these guys to be the quarterback of the defense. Think about it that way. So his head spinning, just like all the other freshman linebackers. He's going to be in the box eventually, but also somebody who can be a, a hybrid and versatile and be outside and do different things. So they're trying to figure out where his his fit is for now. And I think he's going to be okay. He's going to be good. Uh, and might yeah. get some playing time towards the end of the year. It has put on some good weight. We were told. Yeah he he looks he looks like he's ready. <laughs> he look he, you know he he showed up. He was thin in high school. He was kind of lanky. He looked good. He had yeah. the body. He obviously had the frame. But he's yeah. had probably 10, 15 good pounds. And uh, Auburn is very excited about him. Yep. Uh, and so uh, Camden Brown, I've heard good things about Camden, man. I have, and uh, he, he's and what I was told last week was he is more of the Camden, the freshman Camden, than the sophomore Camden. He's getting back to his old ways. He's getting more comfortable. He, obviously, he's a little bit. Uh, he, he's healthier. He's healthy now. Uh, been making a lot of plays. Uh, so I've heard. I've heard very good things. Very encouraging signs on Camden Brown that he's getting back to what we were seeing two years ago, and that had everybody so excited about this kid. So. Interesting if him and Cam Coleman are in the game at the same time. If you have both those guys on the outside, I would be interested to see that look. And you know what, what else I was told about him? Iron sharpens iron. We hear that all the time. But when you get guys in there like Cam Coleman and those guys, and, 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 and these guys, it, it, it'll force you to either step up or cave. Yeah. And he has You're stepped right up. That. You're right. He has stepped yeah. up. They, it, the guys that were there a year ago, if you're coming back, and knowing what's coming in, you better make a move, <laughs> or or you're done, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's Step how it or, or the transfer Jeffrey, portals right over here. <laughs> um, you remember when Camden and uh, Rivado Fairweather were walking through the complex? Yeah, Saturday? guys, 
I, I think they're about the same height. They look they look alike. They were just I mean, they were right at the same height. And I was kind of surprised. I didn't realize that Camden was that tall. Um I think he's getting ready to 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 have an uptick. I think he's gonna have better hands this season. I think a lot of things are gonna be fixed with him. Good. I think they're finding a, a more of a what he is. Some guys are not do it all receivers. Some guys are not. I, I don't want them doing these certain routes. I don't want them doing this kind of stuff. You go back and watch his high school tape. He was winning a lot of deep balls. That was what he was. Had the reach. Yes. I think that's more of what he is, and I, and they could they could hone in on that. I hope they do. I think that would help him. Cole got to meet uh, Mr. Allendy. Oh yeah, Olandy. Oh, is that what? Allendy. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you had it right the first time. <laughs> You had it right. You said it to him. He's like, yeah, that's right. You're like, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. It's A-L-A. Check this out, Alan. A-L-A-N-D-E-E. Now, who is that? That's Camden's father. Okay. He's freaking awesome. He's awesome. But I, I think the first time I called him Alan D. <laughs> what was I? But it's a Landy. He's fantastic. He's yeah. awesome. He, he He's from South Florida, flies up, watch practice, fly, doesn't miss a game. He is uh you can tell why Camden is such a fantastic guy because that's his, awesome, man. His, his dad's fantastic. Love that guy. Uh and he was there Saturday and uh came over and talked to me and Cole and I think Caleb was over there, Christian won. But uh it was always good to see him. Uh, Camden's a guy I'm telling y'all, he, he's he's a good guy. He's one of the good guys. You want to see him do well. Yeah, I'm pulling for that kid. I I, I really am. I'm pulling for him. And I and that's why last year I hated, you know, people, you know how they get down on some guys. I, I understand yeah. why, but I'm going, man, if y'all just knew this kid, you'd give him a break. You'd give him the benefit of the doubt. You'd, you wouldn't yeah. be so hard on him. No, this it's like the people that get on Chris Moore. And then you see what Chris right. Moore's uh, been able to yes. contribute. You yeah. see Perfect. what Chris Moore's been able to contribute right now in the SEC tournament. So, And Bruce would tell you the same. If, if you really knew Chris Moore and what he is to this team, you would never say a negative thing about him. Correct. He's not, he's not going to be perfect. But I've man, never seen you him do anything that I would say anything negatively about him. He, he's an effort he's, guy. He's not the four star guy that everybody thought they were getting when when he signed. Right. Uh, he was a big. He was a big recruiting win. I got he you. absolutely. He absolutely was a big recruiting win. I mean, we we took him from Arkansas and Memphis. Right. Those were his top to, uh, the top three for him. But you got to have glue guys, right? You got to have guys yes. that are program guys, guys that it, not everybody can be a superstar, not in a team sport. And I think it's hard for people to understand that sometimes. And you know what? Most people in Camden's situation probably would have bolted in this offseason. And, and I wouldn't have blamed him. In but today's – yeah. Yeah, right. In today's world of the transfer portal, absolutely. Path of least resistance. Here we yeah. go. You know what I mean? There, there are a lot of kids that just say, you know what, I just want to play. He, he could go somewhere where he's guaranteed a starting spot. Sure. Um, and he's not going to be that here. Um, all right, so Alex wanted to know last thing, men's basketball tournament champion. National champions, I will admit this. I, I'm I'm going to recuse myself from this because I have I don't even know who the number one seeds are. I know UConn's number one. Yeah. Does he want to know what Auburn's chances are in the tournament, Zach, or was it? I think he just said, like, who do we think is going to win it all? Ooh. Um, it's so early. With all, well, like, I haven't even had a chance to look through all the matchups yet. It's extremely early. I don't know, man. <laughs> I really like UConn. I do. I think they're a really good team. Uh, the only comparison point I have for them this year as it pertains to Auburn is they both played Indiana. Both of them had 20-point wins on neutral court sites. And I think Auburn's got some favorable matchups um, against them where they can expose them in certain spots. Can they beat them? I don't know. Um uh, you know, Iowa State looked really good in the Big 12 Conference Championship Tournament. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if that if the region that Auburn's in, the national champion comes from there. Because Illinois ran through the Big Ten Tournament, too. So you have the Big Ten Tournament champ in, the, in that bracket as well as the three seed. Iowa State just got done be beating Houston by, what, 20? Right. Houston's a really good team. Uh, yeah. Man, I've, I've only watched SEC basketball, so I'm kind of biased. But I, I, I give me Tennessee. Mm. Dalton Neck, dude. If he gets don't, rolling, don't tell Stephen Pearl that. 
<laughs> you know what, though? He's got limitations as it pertains to the defensive side of the ball. Sure. Um, yeah. He can be exposed at times, and he has not – honestly, since he played against us, he's not played great. Like he, It's like he poured it all out against us, and then the last couple of games since then, it's been like 15 points, 16 points. Well, 10 points. Yeah, I mean, he can, he can get hot and win a game, no doubt. Basketball is totally different than football, but this is why I love a playoff. You're going to get their best. You're just going to get their best. If they know they're fixing to go home, and, and, and a guy like – I think those kind of guys come alive in these tournaments. So that's why. I, I, I'm looking for the teams that have a guy like him. Understandable. That's, that's what I'm thinking. No, hey, look, you got to. Most teams that win a national championship have a superstar, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the unique thing about this Auburn team. I said, as good as Janai is, would you declare him a superstar? I don't know. I mean, he's he's first team All SEC, so maybe superstar. Third, third team All. I think he was a third team All American. Sporting News, maybe. Yeah, he's he's close to that status. I think. He's the closest thing Auburn has. Right. Yeah. He's the closest thing Auburn has. When I think of a superstar, I'm thinking a guy that can score in any way possible. Just any possible way. He's he's knocking down threes. He's got a mid range. He he's driving on you. You know, he gets to the foul line all the time. Broom is not one dimensional at all. He's got he can actually shoot pretty good uh from three, but he's more of a post guy all the time. I would say he's one level below a superstar, so maybe just a star. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I agree with that. That's good. No, I, I completely agree with that. Um, if Auburn's going to win this, it's going to be because of that ten man rotation and because they don't drop off. That is, it, Auburn has it's Nolan Richardson, Arkansas type theory right now, right? You mm. you, you remember the the early nineties Arkansas teams that just forty minutes of hell where they were pressing all game long. That was fun uh, to watch. Yeah, I'm trying to think. My minor boy, T.J. Cleveland, went there. Sure did. Sure did. Corliss Williamson back in the day. Ooh. Man, um, he was tough, wasn't he? God, man. Wasn't he? Mm. And then who was the big three-point shooter for him? I'll think of it here in a second, man. But anyway, that that's where Auburn's going to win. It's it, it's up and down the roster with depth and making sure that they're running guys through and, and, and playing just – lights out defense because that's what effort energy defense is what's going to carry this team in the tournament in my honest opinion and they're going to scotty thurman yes scotty thurman good call jeffrey i googled (laughs) arkansas 90s basketball three-pointer shooter hey scotty Thurman, Thurman. he used to fill it up dude um i'm probably going to stick with uconn winning it all I, i just think they're the most complete team right now Mm. oh he was so good scott thurman they're they're in all who are the number one seeds Con, UConn, oh. Houston, Purdue, Purdue, and North Carolina. Yeah, all four oh. of those your number one seeds: Arizona, Iowa State, Tennessee, and who's the other two seeds? Zach, um, Marquette. Marquette, Marquette, and I don't like Marquette right now. They've got an injury. Uh, Kentucky's actually a three seed oh. in that bracket, and I like them to advance to the Elite Eight there. But I think Kentucky Not- doesn't have enough experience to win it all. And I think Florida is the seven seed in that bracket. So look for that two seven upset. I could see Florida knocking off Marquette with that injury. Sure would hate to uh, meet Florida. Florida's <laughs> got their own injury. Yeah, Micah Hanlock, who yeah. was recruited by Auburn. <gasps> you know what I mean? Yeah, that, was, that was bad. It was pretty bad. It, yeah, I haven't it seen it, and I would do not want to see it. No. You know, man, it, was, it was a compound fracture for sure. Nope. I mean, nope. the bone was kind of ask. Compound means, yeah, that's what that means. Yeah, right. I mean, Blood. It, it, yeah, his – then the camera caught him like laying on the court, and you saw the blood coming down his leg. It was nasty. <sighs> I mean, that's – look, and I do want to say thoughts and prayers to that young man while we're live sure, on yeah, here right sure, now yeah, because yeah. you never want to see an injury like that. No. Uh, I think Anthony McLemore had a similar injury, and it was probably a year and a half before he was really ever playing – High level basketball, like he just was not the same player the next year coming off that injury. So I, with That's a guy that tall, that that lanky, you know what I mean? It, it's it's just hard, man. Leg injuries are hard for those kind of guys. It's you know, football is the contact sport. That's the one you get hurt in a lot. But basketball has some nasty, nasty injuries. 
I get nervous watching a game and when I just when I turn on the game and I see big guys with skinny ankles not wearing a brace. That Dang. makes me nervous. It makes my stomach hurt because I know what could happen. What? And until you see them in person, like when you're watching it on TV, it doesn't do it justice. But Jeffrey and Cole, you've seen them up close. Mm. You don't realize how big and athletic and fast some of these guys are and how yes. high they jump right. and they come down and the impact with which they have. I mean, yeah. it's it's insane, man. What were you going to say, Zach? Oh, I was going to say, me and Jay were talking about it earlier. For everyone filling out their brackets, McNeese. One more dollar. That's a yeah. dollar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Cal- up to 12. Yeah. Up to- <laughs> <laughs> you have had to pay his whole salary at this point. But I'm yeah. telling you. McNeese, McNeese and what was it? Um, Will James Wade. Patterson are your two lower seated upsets. Isn't Will Wade at McNeese? He yes. sure is, man. And they, they got Gonzaga the first he's, round. He's making a strong ass offer in that first yeah. round. <laughs> Gonzaga, five seed. That's unusual. Well, they right. lost to St. Mary's, right? They did. The St. Mary's is good, though, right? They yes. are. St. Mary's yeah. is really good. That, uh, the 1250 in the jarhead. Ooh. Um, Auburn, <laughs> they just announced Auburn's an 11 seed in the women's tournament. They play Arizona in the 11 seed play in. If they win, they go to Syracuse. Good for Johnny Harris. Big how about you to Johnny Harris. Absolutely. Beat LSU earlier this season. Yeah. Love to see that. Kim Mulkey and all her outfits over there. Oh. <laughs> we got – well, hang on. Two right. more callers. Right, okay. 1836, you're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? This is Eric from Coleman. Um, a big war eagle to you guys after the big win today in basketball. It was Absolutely. a heck of a performance um, all, the, all around. And hey, a Eric. big shout out to uh, the hated bunker favorite, uh, Chris Moore. Um, had a great game. Um, yes, he did. And, uh, but my, um, my questions are more football related. Um, one is uh, kind of about the quarterback situation. I don't really have a favorite. I don't really care. Just whoever helps us win is, is all I care about. But I've heard the phrase many times, like quarterback, you want a quarterback who will throw your receiver open yep. instead of waiting for your receiver to get open to throw it. And through some of the games last year, which granted the receiving core was lackluster, um, it seemed like Thorne was more of one that, waited here as the receivers were open to throw it like he wasn't throwing them open leading them open um do you think with another year in a system better receivers that that it's something he can improve on or do you think that that's just a, a mental like block for him um because in the which i know it was the game was over but when uh hank brown came in it seemed like he was more willing to throw them open instead of waiting for them to be open to, to throw the ball. Um, just wanted y'all's opinion on that. And then my other question is uh, for us to win eight or nine games next season, do you, what three offensive players and what three defensive players do you think need to step up to, to take the next step to step up for us to be able to do that? My offensive guys would be Peyton Thorne, Coleman, and Thompson. Defense would be Reed, Falk, and uh, Kay and Lee. Uh, appreciate it, guys. Hey, hold on, and, uh, really hold enjoyed on, the show. I don't. This is my first time calling, so um, but really enjoy it. And I am a member of the the corner. Um, I post under Kyle Resner. Uh, but enjoy it, guys. Thanks for Man. taking my call. You, you listen about as good as Jessica does. <laughs> <laughs> being, being from Coleman, I guarantee you he don't bag his Clippers. No, man, not from no. Coleman. <laughs> but Ben, if you're listening to us, drop your comments into the uh, into the chat, my man. We would love to know the uh, the answer to the question. The POW. POW. And uh, and if you do bag your grass, what do you what do you do with it? I'm well, interested in that. If you don't take it uh, to the curb, he's still, oh, he's still there. He's still there. What do you say? I do not bag my grass. 
Okay. Uh, there you go. How, how many acres you got? Oh, man, it, I mean, it, it's a small yard. It's like uh, like 0. 0.8 or so. Okay. 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 So we've got a good uh, grade here. We've got a good example here. He's got less than an acre. It's just a big yard. He doesn't bag them. Oh, man, is my, is my mic went off? I think it, it might have. It sounds a little different. You don't sound bad, it, though. It, it, it sounds like you're on the computer mic. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, here we go. now that's, hey, here we go. There's that voice. That's <laughs> that that booming voice. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Alan Head. Uh, okay, let's get to Eric. He uh, wants to know uh, a throw and open. I'll let y'all handle that. Yeah. yeah. I, Alan, I want to hear what you what you think about this. Um, so to, uh, and, go ahead, and Zach. Tony, you start. And Zach, I want to hear both of y'all. And, and I guess Jeff or two, if you want to. Uh, I'll, I'll defer. Okay. okay. Right. I'll, I'll start us off. So to me, that's the anticipatory part of being a quarterback, right? And it comes from feeling comfortable within the offense and knowing the structure of the offense, having a familiarity with the receivers. I think that was less to do about the receivers and more to do about Peyton Thorne not getting there until summer. And then mm. some of the discombobulation on offense as far as who was calling plays, some of the concepts, the footwork that he wasn't necessarily comfortable with. I think he talked about that, about he's changing things and going back to some things that he's more comfortable with. I think Ken Austin is going to do a good job building him from the ground up as far as getting his feet right, getting his head right, knowing his side adjustments, and feeling comfortable within the offense. And I think he does have to get some cohesion there with the receivers. He's got to have a rapport. There has to be some familiarity there. So when the guy's supposed to break his route off, he knows he's going to do it. So there has to be trust there in between the quarterback and the receiver. But I don't put as much on them as far as the throwing them open part because it did look like he was waiting on guys. It, there, were, there were multiple different occasions where it looked like Peyton just wasn't comfortable, didn't know exactly maybe where his – maybe he knew where his hot was and he was just trying to go to something else. But it, it looked like several times he was holding on to the ball just because well, he wasn't sure what he was seeing back there. And that, to me, comes more with an unfamiliarity with the offense and not necessarily understanding conceptually what they were trying to accomplish in certain on certain plays or something. But, Zach, Cole, how do you feel? Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. I think it was more his lack of comfort in the pocket sometimes as well. With like he didn't trust the offensive line either, so therefore his eyes weren't downfield when they needed to be. And so he was late on some reads, and then also too, he like you said, he didn't trust his wide receivers to be in the right spot, especially early in the season. I'm thinking like a And M game, early Georgia game. There was a little bit of he was like, I know he should be there, but I'm gonna hold it just in case he isn't. And he didn't have that extra second to hold it. And then he was late on throws. I thought you saw him improve on it, especially late in the Iron Bowl. You go watch the Iron Bowl yes, tape versus the AM tape. He that trust in that um, I guess camaraderie with his wide receivers was kind of built at that point. That's the biggest thing in spring. You have a bunch of receivers, some of them have experience, but none of them have been the guy. We didn't have a guy go over 400 last year. Mm -mm. So who's gonna step Crazy. into the room and take and be like, well, I'm gonna go for seven, eight, nine hundred. Who's the guy he can throw it to? Because when you think of Bama, Texas, Georgia, they had a guy where if it broke down, you could trust that that guy was gonna go make a play. Auburn didn't have that guy. Like when stuff broke down for Peyton Thorne, he was just running for his life because he didn't know who he could trust to go make a play. So I, I think this year you'll see it be better, especially with upgrades along the offensive line. We've we've talked about the talent in the receiver room increasing. And a lot of those guys are here during spring. They'll have summer workouts, fall camp. I don't think you'll see the growing pains early in the season as much as you did last year. I like well, it. Tech. And I, right. I will say this. That's that's the thing that blows my mind about the Maryland game. You saw how well he played in the Iron Bowl and the progression, that it, the step he took forward. And then it was like a complete reversion when you got against Maryland, uh, specifically in those first two quarters. But, Cole, where are you at on it? Zach, I, I, you reminded me uh, – he did look better in the Iron Bowl. He made some throws and threw some guys open. It was Caleb Burton. That was one guy. And Javaris Johnson was a big receiver in that game, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Neither one of those guys got targeted in A&M. All right? No. All right, so I think we all agree there was uncomfortability. Well, why? And this is something I studied so closely during the season. I think a lot of it's on Peyton. I think a lot of it's on the play calling. Mm -hmm. I mean – you know, structure of the offense. Uh, and I think a lot of it is on the receivers. 
which never get talked about too much in this in this conversation. Um, I you know I would ask I would answer this question uh, with another question: How do you know it was Peyton and not the receivers? What evidence you, do you have? Prove that to me. You don't. Well put. How do you know it was it was the receivers and not Peyton? On the other side of that coin. Unless you got a copy of the 22 and you know what play was called, you have no clue. Exactly. Because if you're a member of the corner, I break down every single play, play by play. I give you what I see on that play. Sometimes I can't. Can't give you everything because I don't know. If it was a throw that looked like it was off, I'm not going to act like I knew what was happening because I don't. That's the annoying part of this. Because everybody's going to look at it and say, ah, Peyton Thorne sucks. I don't want him. Anybody but Thorne, I, I see that all the time. Maybe. I mean, maybe he really sucks. I don't know. But I think there was <laughs> – I mean, I hear you. Uh, it, it, it's maybe it. That could be it. He could suck. But I don't have a way to say that with full confidence because I think the receivers are wrong a lot. I think. I don't know for sure. I think that the play calling was discombobulated, as you said, Alan. Yeah. So I don't know. I can't. I can't come out there and join y'all. I can't. I can't do it. Um, I can't say he's great either. Can't go there. I want to see what he what he is with an upgraded room and receiver and and, and better play calling and better organization. That's what I want to see. I think we're going to have a truer picture of what Peyton Thorne is as we move into fall camp. Like, and, and for anybody, because I, I, I there are some people that do podcasts that are in this in this Auburn sphere that are, you know, it's not a real competition. And, you know I mean? They, they've already said Peyton Thorne's the leader, so it's not a real competition. Well, yeah, that's coach speak, man. Okay. You're, you're trying to build confidence with Peyton, but it's as open a competition as it possibly can be. To me, if Hank Brown goes out there and he's the better quarterback, Q Freeze is going to play Hank Brown. If Walker White's the better quarterback, he's going to play Walker White. If it's Holden Garner, so on and so forth. It just so happens right now that you've got three days of practice and he's the most experienced right. quarterback you have. So, yes, he's the leader by default. Okay. Um, but that's that's just my two cents. And that's a rant. I've been I, I've been sitting on that one for a while, man. My apologies. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that question came up. I really am. Uh, Eric has a second part of his question, or second question. If, if Auburn is to get to that over to eight wins, even that ceiling of nine wins that we think it is, they're going to have to have people step up. Yes. Who are three people on offense, three people on defense that's going to – I liked his defensive picks. I think he said Kay and Lee, Keldrick Falk, and Deron Reed. Yeah. Uh, offensively, Rivaldo Fairweather for me, that he's got to take a step forward because you talk about that Iron Bowl, there were two big passes he could have reeled in that would have been massive gains for us if he's a little bit more consistent catching the football. But Rivaldo Fairweather, for me, has got to take a step forward. Jarquez Hunter has got to take a step forward, in my like honest it. opinion. I like it. And then last but not least, um, Jeremiah Wright on the offensive line, in my opinion, has got to take a step forward. That's, That's a pivotal great, piece for the right guard position. I think if he can play up to his ceiling, that takes the offensive line to another level. That's a great pick. Would it, would it, uh, would it be unfair if I said Percy Lewis? That's who. That was my number one. Jeffrey, pass protection on for the quarterback. Blind side. That's your left tackle. He's look. He was brought in to be the left tackle. He's he's got to be able to do it right. I, I agree. Side. I Let's agree. See, who's, who's your number I, I, two, Jeffrey? Let's see if we line up here. <laughs> uh, well, Eric said uh, Peyton Thorne was number him. Uh, was yeah. He's, I think he mentioned he's him on, first. He's, he's on got. He's, he's got to be. Uh, or or who, whomever the quarterback is, the quarterback position has to step up. No doubt about it. That's the easiest pick. In my, I mean, that's almost a given, right? It's like, oh, that's an easy mm -hmm. pick. Yeah, yeah, that's why I just stayed away from yeah. it. Because it's, uh, you know what I mean? Whoever, we, Peyton Thorne, Hank, Holden, whoever it is, you got to step up if you're going to get eight or nine. Yeah. Would my, it be unfair to pick two different wide receivers? Yes. You probably need more no. than one to step up. Uh, hell no, yeah. It's I thought it said fair. fair. I thought it said fair, yes. <laughs> it, it would be fair. <laughs> um, and it would also be Jay Fair. That would be my pick. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And Camden Brown. I was thinking Camden as well. So okay. that's Camden two. was my number one. Like, if Camden's got to step up. That was – that was he, he was on my list. Well, I think Jay Fair's 
like a playmaker, like with the ball in his hands. And if you can get him right before he gets the ball in his hands, I think he could be a breakout guy. Nobody talks about him anymore. And I think it's because he just disappeared down the stretch. He did. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't even on the field uh, for long periods of time. Specifically, as we got down that that home stretch, it just felt like Javarius Johnson kind of overtook him at that position. Yeah. And he just right. he really never got on the field after that. Defensively, uh, definitely, I, I, I like Keldrick Falk. I like yeah, Keldrick I was going to say Falk. definitely Keldrick Falk. Um, I'm going to say Jerry and Thompson. He's got to be the guy in the back end. Losing Jalen Simpson, I don't think people realize what a loss that is. I mean, he was absolutely your your quarterback in the back end. So he's got to it, it, Jaron Thompson's got to be the guy, and then to me, Austin Keys. I, I'm picking a defender at each level. I think right. Austin Keys has got to take a massive step forward, and or Dorian Maosi, the middle uh, backer. Yeah, your your Mike linebacker is going to have to take a step forward. I do not think we got enough production from that position this time last year. Obviously, Asante played – he elevated this play significantly, but I don't think we had enough consistency in the middle. To me, for this defense to be what it can be, your middle linebacker is going to have to get downhill and hit some people in the mouth in the run game. I don't think anyone would help Auburn more by improving and getting better than Jason Jones. Oh, great pick. Fantastic pick. If he becomes what he looks like <clears> – <throat> And what his potential says he can be. If he becomes the Tarzan that he looks like, I start feeling a little bit better about the defensive line. And he's got it in him. He does. I've seen flashes where it's like, but he he cannot get pushed around in doubles because right now I don't see anybody on Auburn's roster that can can just withstand double teams because you're going to play teams that run inside zone on you all day long. Definitely. And, and that was Auburn's big problem. You just – um yeah, Justin Rogers was okay at it. He was so-so, maybe 50-50. Every once in a while, he'd have a really good stand against a double. Other times, he'd get washed out. If you're getting washed out on a double, you will get beat. The you score gotta, will not be in your favor. No, you got to at least anchor. You know what I mean? And to your point, I love who Jason Jones is as a person. I think he is a leader on this team. But I'm with you. He got displaced at, at, at the line of scrimmage far too often. Right. Not for me to feel comfortable with him being your starting nose tackle, unless right. that improves. If that improves and he plays like you said up to his ceiling, I think Jason's capable of being. You know, he's capable of playing in the NFL if he can play up to his ceiling. Right. But he's he's got to do it. And I don't think Trill Carter's big enough to play significant snaps. I mean, I think he's going to play. But I don't think you can you can lean on him for more than thirty snaps a game. I agree. I don't think he's the guy that is supposed to be out there that much. Now he's a good little change of pace guy, smaller. He can win against doubles at times. I think he's a nice pickup, but he's not your lead guy. You know, you know. Mm -mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, you you want him in the rotation, twenty to thirty snaps. In my opinion, that's that's what I would feel comfortable with from Trill Carter. Zach, who, Same. who's who's your defensive guys? I'm curious. JD Rim. Oh, like yeah. That came to mind immediately, cool. especially with corner having to replace like guys like DJ James. Like you mentioned, Simpson in the back end, all those guys. You got to get some somebody to step up and be the guy back there. I, you know, I wanted to say Jason, but since you already said it, I'm going to go Deron Reed. He's got to, I, I think this is the year he's got to step in and make an impact. And then, but like, like, like Allen has said, there you I go. Think, I, I, I think someone at the linebacker spot has to step up. And if I had to pick somebody, I think it's Austin Keys because yeah. Asante did so yeah. much last year. If you can get somebody just to elevate their play a little bit next to him, you feel really good about our linebacking core. Because Asante is going to come in as an all SEC linebacker next year. He just needs someone to run with him on the other side. As somebody who has been pretty harsh on the linebackers in the past few years. I'm feeling okay about where Auburn's linebackers are at right now. Yeah. Pretty good. They might you be okay. Got, you got some legitimate experience in that experience in production, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that for the first time in a while, legitimate experience in production with Asante coming back. 
I don't think we know what most he's going to be just yet in our scheme, but he I brings agree. over good production from Duke. And then Austin Keys is a guy when he played. Now, remember, he was injured, and I got to, I, I have to give him credit for that. I mean, he played with an injured right hand, right or left hand. I can't remember. Yeah, he had pretty the, much. He had the club. He had the Patrick Willis club for a minute. He there. Sure, sure, Patrick Willis, dude, you talking about a, just an epitome of a linebacker, bro. That's a linebacker. <laughs> if you want to know what it's supposed to look like. That's exactly what it's supposed to look like. Um, and another also, former old Miss guy. Could you also maybe look at Woodyard too? Potentially as someone who has got to finally yeah. to his own. It would help. It would help. Uh, I don't know. Uh, to I, me, it, the clear cut answer to me is Jason Jones. That's the guy that makes Auburn football better. I agree with you, but I'm I'm also with you on Woodyard. Is now the time for him to move into the two deep? Can he finally start to kind of get onto the field because he's a guy that had a lot of um, a lot of prestige in the high school in in high school, and it, it just is. has not translated at this point. Now I think he had a pretty significant injury his senior year, correct? Or maybe it was at, yeah. at the beginning of his senior year, and so yeah, he got yeah. to Auburn a little overweight. And then I don't think he'd ever really took underneath Harson. And then last year he just kind of got buried behind some veteran guys. But he, can can he pass Wesley Steiner as that fourth linebacker? Yeah, he he's I, one of those guys. When you walk out there on the field and you're just looking, you're you're looking around. Who stands out just from a appearance standpoint? Woodyard's gonna catch your eye. He always does. So I hope he makes a, a, a jump. I heard he yeah. dropped some weight this year too. He I looks he real lean. I mean, very lean right now. So, another announcement: Auburn plays Yale Friday at three fifteen on TNT. That's it, that's what we needed to get. Yeah. yeah, they they especially coming back from that because they poured everything out in Nashville, man. I mean, they didn't leave anything on the table, dude. They were all in from an emotional standpoint, physical standpoint. I mean, they're going to be drained for the next day or so. Yeah. Uh, so getting that extra day of rest is going to be huge for them, especially going out to the West Coast. Yeah. Well, we got two callers real quick, so we'll knock these out fast. Three, six, two, four. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? Three, six, two, four. You're live. Hey guys, this is Chappie from uh, Gaston, Alabama. Chappie, Chappie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, home of uh, Derek Nix and Cadillac Williams. Yeah, old yeah. Gaston, Atala, uh, and, Rick, and Rick and Bubba. I, yeah, Rick and Bubba. Yeah, Andre Kirkpatrick. Andre Kirkpatrick. Anyway, and guys, uh, <laughs> I just want to say a big War Eagle. Uh, for winning the SEC championship. Uh, you know, when Bruce Pearl broke down on the court talking about his daddy, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just lost my father to stage four bone cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when he, he was my best friend. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when that, I started squalling. But, uh, you know, great for our basketball team. They won. They didn't play great. Uh, I hope they do well. Uh, Y'all answered most of my questions. Uh, But I I, I just think Peyton Thorne sucks. You know what, Chappie, here – I mean – let, let me give you a rebut. When you were talking about that, Cole, and you were like, maybe he sucks. And and I I was like, well, maybe he does. But then I thought, man, how many yards does he throw for Michigan? You can't suck and throw for 6,000 yards. Well, at, at Chappie, Michigan State, I would just ask you why you think so. Well, I mean, Cole mentioned it, and uh, um, I mean, I, I'm not saying he sucks. He's all. I mean, he's got to be good starting the SEC. But I do like that Ken Austin is the quarterback's coach, and that's his primary job because. Um, you know, Hugh Freeze, even when he was announced as the head coach, you know, he gave Ken Austin a lot of praise. I don't know if, you know, Peyton Thorne needs to go to some ballerina classes to get his foot, like, you know, his footwork better. But uh, 
I think it was our offensive line. Um, I think Peyton, of course, you know, he, he didn't go through spring. Uh, I'm going to come in town during A day. But, uh, you know, I think Percy Lewis, y'all think he's going to start at left guard? Tackle. Or left, left tackle. tackle sorry. Yeah, I, I think so. I think he was brought in to do so. If he doesn't, then one of two things happen. One, he's not as good as they thought, and that's not good. Or two, somebody beat him, and that could be good or bad. I don't know exactly yet. Right. It, I mean, yeah. I'm with you, Cole. I, I think if if he's not starting, then that means T.J. Johnson took a massive leap forward. Yeah. And yeah. I, it, for, for the record, I think Jake Thornton is extremely high on T.J. Johnson. I think he thinks he's got all these C type potential, but it was important to get a piece in here of somebody who a legitimate left tackle that could play this year because you just don't want to lean on a red shirt freshman. Right, right. Well, I know, I know. Hugh Freeze told old, old Percy he better stay off motorcycle. I've seen that somewhere on the Auburn page. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a clip of him. Um, yeah, but man, uh, I'm looking forward to the season. I hope our offensive line. I think that was a lot, and then I think the timing. Uh, between, I mean, you know, the receiving core, obviously, you know, there was just a huge disconnection there, you know, and the good thing is, is, uh, you know, I, and I'm not down in uh, Peyton Thorne, you know, I mean, I, I don't think he sucks, but, um, you know, I, I mean, well, Chep, we can all say there were production in the first couple of games, you know, some great improvements. We and, can all say that he didn't perform up to his capability. I that's think exactly that, what I was going to say. There were times last year that he fucked, he, he flat out sucked. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, agree. yeah. I mean, I agree. and you don't do what you do at Michigan State. I mean, unless it's, I, I mean, I don't know. Sure. No, I, maybe he had a great offensive line, and you know he got to stand back there for five seconds. I don't know. A great route wide receiver. Um, yeah, they have, know, but you know, I played quarterback in high school, and I know you got to do your check downs. But I love that Hugh Freeze has taken over play calling. Me too. Uh, he's great at that, and I hated to see Cadillac leave, but uh, you know. With Derek Nix's experience, uh, you know, he's had, what, 20 years? What, you know? Yeah. Uh, most of it's been in the SEC. So, um, anyways, guys, I ain't called. It's been a while, but uh, I've been a, a subscriber for two years. And uh hope you guys have a, a blessed week. Happy St. Patrick's Day and a War Damn Eagle. Appreciate you, Chappie. Great stuff, man. I appreciate yeah. you. And it, my condolences to your loss, too. Sorry to hear that about, yeah. about your dad. Now, that Absolutely. that that hit homes for me, for sure. And uh, obviously, I'll be thinking about you. But, no, back to the question. I mean, I think we did a good job of playing devil's advocate on Peyton Thorne because there are a lot of people that just have kind of written him off somewhat. And I don't think people necessarily realize – I don't think it was a. I don't, I don't think it's a true assessment of who he is as a player last year. I think you're going to get a cleaner assessment of who he really is or what he's capable of at Auburn this fall. And if the reports are similar to last year, then I think you got to find a different quarterback. But if he's more the player he was when he had Kenneth Walker in the backfield, and you're going to have a good running game, and you're going to have a good offensive line to lean on, and can you get a couple wide receivers to take a step forward? I think he's got an opportunity to be, you know, above 2,500 yards and, you know, 18 plus touchdowns. I think that's truly on the table. And if you're above that to me, well, that's going to get you seven, eight wins, in my honest opinion. I mean, you you were close to seven wins and you threw for like 1,700 yards in the regular season or 1,800 yards, whatever it was, which is just mind boggling. We talked earlier that he had to be a top six. QB in the SEC, I think, is what the caller said earlier. Where would he even rank right now? Because I don't even know if he's a top 10 QB in the conference, right? The second. No, well, he's not. No, tell me who. All right, to be top 10, so you got 16 teams in the SEC, right? Yeah. So, so tell me 
who's Vanderbilt starter? I'm sure he's um, better than that. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm putting Vandy start over. It's the kid from New Mexico State. Oh, last you're right. Oh, so he goes over. Pavia. Pavia. I, I, that's the definition of irony, is it not? It, yeah. it is a little bit. But you, I mean, you got Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers, Jackson Dart, Jalen mm. Milrow, Brady Cook. I'm putting Nico over Peyton right now at Tennessee. I think sure. Graham Mertz had a better season last year than him. You got Blake Shapin coming into Mississippi State, who led Baylor to a Big 12 championship two years ago. Yeah, I'm I'm a little torn on Blake Shapin. I think he's got some good tools, but I don't know how much that's going to trade. I mean, they, they were just not good on offense at Baylor for whatever the reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who it, Brock Vandergriff's at Kentucky, right? And yeah, he's yeah. never I, he's never had any significant I put, snaps. I put Thorne over him. Like I put Thorne over any of the guys who haven't played. Like I think Jackson Arnold could be a good QB for Oklahoma, but I'm not putting him over Peyton until I see him actually play outside of the bowl game. And who's A and M starter going to be? I think it's the kid that got injured this time last year. Wegman. Wegman. Yeah, and, and I I've been impressed with what Connor Wegman has shown on tape, but he's never played a full season, so. I don't think you really know what he's at, what he is either. And then, and then this, isn't it Nussmeier at LSU? LSU yeah. He's I really like there. that kid. I think he's going to so, be yeah. good. And I, I want to be clear in saying that I am playing devil's advocate on Peyton Thorne with everyone here. And I, I do that because as, as extensively as I've studied each and every play that he took a snap at quarterback for Auburn, I don't have the answer. And if I don't, I don't know how anybody else does. I'd be surprised if you did have the direct answer. Now, you can guess and get it right. I'm trying to figure him out. I think he needs to get better at a lot of things. But to say that nothing else needs to get better, it's just him. That ain't right to me. No, I mean, all right. And so let's let's go backwards. Let's look at Auburn history to one of my favorite quarterbacks because he was playing quarterback when I kind of became – I guess, conscious of it really understanding the game. But think about Ben Lear and how poorly he played in that first year that he was a starter at Auburn. Had to be benched and replaced by Gabe Gross, if I remember correctly, Jeffrey. Sounds right. Um, and then came in the next year and had to save us against Appalachian State, where we almost got beat by a Division II team and really took off from that point moving forward. Tommy Tuberville had come in. They ran a different offensive scheme. It was much more tailored to what Ben Leard wanted to do. I'm going to be interested to see. The scheme is a huge part to me. The scheme, the play calling, the whole offensive operation. How much cleaner is that? Because I think it's very clear to all of us that are on this panel right now. The operation was not clean. There was a lot of moving parts there. Peyton wasn't in spring. How much does that play a difference? I tend to believe it's going to be it's going to play a, a pretty big difference. I think he's going to understand the offense better. He's going to have just a better feel of the offense overall and better chemistry to his wide receivers. But we'll see. Again, I think this is a true competition. I honestly yeah. believe Hugh Freeze knows he's got to play the best quarterback. He's not going to go out there and just say, screw it, man. I'm going to play Peyton because he's my guy, and if we only win six games, then that's that's good enough. Now, that's that's not his thought process right now. That's I was going to say, if Peyton wins the job. Right. Last call of the night, zero five zero six. You're live. Who are we talking to? Where are you calling from? It's old hog bone. Oh, hog hey. bone. It's been a minute. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, you know, I am I hang out on that chat a lot there. Uh, <laughs> I, I but, see you in there. Uh, I was going to tell you, uh, that's the only thing I put the bag on the clipping is uh, down there by the pond, and I throw it out there as a grass car. Let oh, them okay. eat it back. We can always count on Hogbone to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I think I got this SEC tournament figured out. Uh, I I think a uh, uh, I think the only thing that that matters about is if you are going to be on AQ or uh, something like that. That's the only thing the committee waits for to to make any adjustments on because they had the first five I think by Friday. Yeah. Hmm. So I I mean it's what do we get out of that thing, uh, Alan? Do we get money or a little bit of something, just pride, or what is it? With regard to uh 
the SEC and the number of AQs that they're asking for? Is that what you're talking about, Hogbone? No, I'm talking about the committee. I'm sorry, I wasn't very, didn't make myself real clear. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of fuming a little bit, but uh, no, you good. Go ahead. Hey, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad we won it. But yeah. as far as I heard them say yesterday that oh, they wait, you know, and stay up late to to tweak the, you know, oh. tweak everything. So, all right. and, uh, go ahead. It, this is what I will say is that there's a lot of predetermination before you get into conference tournaments. Realistically, it's an automatic qualifier if you win it. And that's a big piece of it because it can cause you to re- to re-rack your board. But I think moving into the conference tournament, or at least this is my assessment from some of the, the guys that are better at doing this than I am as far as the slating goes. Auburn was a four seed going into the SEC tournament. I think they solidified themselves and they probably took the first day's action into play. And I don't know how much stock they even put into Saturday or Sunday. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I think they had already predetermined kind of how they were going to do that. And what hurt Auburn more than anything, in my honest opinion, was the out of conference schedule. I mean, I think Auburn's conference schedule was good as good as anyone, but having Indiana and USC underperform, really kind of hurt us uh, from a from a standing standpoint or a national stature standpoint. Had they been better or what we thought they were going to be, those would have been two potential quad one wins that have been really good tournament resume builders. Unfortunately, those teams just couldn't get out of their own way this year, and so that hurt us from a resume standpoint. Also, the Appalachian State loss, while it was a quad one loss, had you won that one, it would have looked a lot better to the selection committee. So, I think there were some things that Auburn shot themselves in the foot with, it's, but I've never liked how they predetermine, you know, not necessarily waiting. To me, it would almost feel better as if you could announce it late Sunday night where they actually took all the information in on that last day, but it's more of a full body of work. And I, I think for the most part, they got it right. I could argue with you that Auburn's a three seed. I mean, I think you could definitely make that argument, but I don't believe Auburn's a two or a one if you're taking in the full criteria of evaluating a full season. No, I don't need that. I, I thought if anything, they played their way into a three, but you got you to gotta beat your way out anyway. So it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if we get out of that uh, that section we in, I think we're going to be all right. I agree. Look, if you're if your goal is a national championship, Hugh, then you're going to have to play good teams. You're going to have to beat the best teams. You would have to beat, in, in my opinion, UConn's potentially the best team to win a national championship. You'd have to play them anyway. So you might as well play them wow. in the round. You know what I mean? In the Sweet 16 and get it over with, and um, so let the chips fall where they may. And who knows, man? Maybe Bruce will have his have his guys ready to play coming off some rest have a great scheme put in place and, and and catch them. And this is the the one thing that I love about the tournament and I hate about the tournament. It's not a true definition to me of who's the best team because all it takes is one night for you to be off. One night you're off, you get beat, and that's all it's going to take. And so it can be anybody's night in the tournament, and that's the attractive part of it, and that's also the part to me that's that you grit your teeth about because like in the NBA where you get a best out of seven, that's a true assessment of who's the best team, right? Sure. Because you get a big enough sample size. But, again, every there's nobody in America that doesn't love a playoff, right? There's nobody in America that doesn't love an Apparently there are. Apparently there are. Well, I've, I've had some discussions with folks that don't like the playoff format in college football. How about this? Auburn yeah. is the, has the six best, best odds to win the national championship. Hey, I believe it. Listen. You ain't ever gonna have a path like Kansas, um, North Carolina, and Kentucky. Kentucky. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? And they made it through that. Crazy. No, I agree. And Virginia, yeah, yeah Virginia too. Yeah. You yeah, can make up dribble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. he's still dribbling somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't picked up his dribble yet. Well, I'm, yeah. gonna be, I'm gonna be honest with you. The double dribble doesn't bother me as much as that weak ass foul call. Agreed. Yeah, that that was the worst. I'm like, you know, we all talk about that, but that foul call was worth that, I think. But significantly. Anyway. Oh Lord. I, I was I have one quick other quick point I wanted to bring up, Matt, a little bit about uh cold uh, on football. 
Do you think that being fine trail being there, do you think that hurts us as far as bringing in some D-line guys uh, from the high school? Or, or, or how long is it going to take to you think for that them to find out that he knows that, you know he's going to be a good one? And I'll yeah. that. I'll let Appreciate yeah. you, Hogbone. Good stuff. Hey, man. Here. Love y'all. Don't be a stranger, big dog. Hey, I, I, I think, think uh, all the time. <laughs> I I think uh it didn't matter who was gonna take over. Jeremy Garrett had built a strong class before he took the Jacksonville Jaguars job. You know, um Malik Autry, Andrew, uh a- Antonio Coleman, um the other two, Kaylin, Kaylin Edwards and, and yep. Jordan Crawford, which I thought was the best. Nobody had a defensive line like that committed in college football for the 25 class. That was the best. Um, so when you make a change on that, it's, it's gonna, there's going to be some transition now. Don't forget who was on campus Saturday. Antonio Coleman. Antonio Coleman came on in sporting an awesome Auburn hat that I would, I don't know if it's, it's being sold out there, but it was pretty cool. I liked that hat. It was like the trucker style. Anyway, he came on back. I, I'm i telling you, there was a good relationship with Von Trail and all the guys that were committed. It's going to be a minute until it gets rolling. It's just part of the transition. When it looked so, so good, and now you've lost a little bit of that, it, it hurts, but there's a lot to be built here and a long way to go, and I think he's, he's going to be able to get relationships built um, more personally than just being the guy there when they're on campus. And it's going to come to fruition before this cycle is over. So I feel pretty good. I feel pretty good about his recruiting skills. I, I, I don't know much about him as a defensive line coach. I have no idea what to expect about that. I don't know. I just don't have any evidence. But I've seen him recruit. And I think he does a pretty dang good job. So we'll see what happens there. I, I, I like the way that's trending. Put it that way. I think if you give him, I think it's the same scenario as last year with Jeremy Garrett. It was, uh, you know, who yeah. is this guy and how's sure. he going to recruit against, you know, the the Bo Davises and the Rodney Garners and and look what he did and right and, and, and he was he was largely responsible for those four early commitments. I'm telling you, man, don't kill Antonio Coleman. Flip back to Alabama. Do not count him out. Absolutely not. And I, I mean, I think I said. When we talked about that on the show, I was like, don't be surprised if he flips again, whether it's to Auburn or not. I, I mean, I think it's very possible that kid flips somewhere. He uh, he was back at Auburn on Saturday, didn't want to talk to the media. We totally respected that and understood. Oh, he was walking around with his Auburn hat and, you know, um, you know, Auburn's, Auburn's certainly a major player for him. Yeah. Um, who else was it? Oh, uh, the kid, Kalen Edwards, I believe, yeah. from Tennessee. Now, he was more of a Jeremy Garrett guy. And again, I don't blame any of these guys. But look, they're saying, "Hey, let, let, let me reopen this recruitment. Let me let me see if that's where I want to go." So, so Auburn's basically not leading anymore. That can change just as easily. That guy loves Auburn. He does. Uh, yeah. Malik Autry was all in when we talked to him. And of course, you know how Malik is. He's going to go on his visits. He's gonna, but man, when it comes down to it, he's in. And he's he's he, he's in. He's recruiting guys to join him. He is after who, – who was he talking about, Cole? I think he said uh, Zion Grady, Eric Winters, yeah. Alan Henderson. Uh-huh. Yep. He's all over these cats. And and I'm, he's, question. I'm um, I have a question for the panel. Shoot. For, for you guys. Um, what are the chances from zero to 100% that – and remember we talked – a lot of questions have come in lately. What is the main thing? Is it NIL? Is it position coach, head coach? What are the chances that when a guy commits to a position coach, that position coach will be there for three to four years? In today's world? Very low. Less than five? Less than five. Less than well, – you I think thinking, about – I was thinking take, take, 10%. I, I think higher than 10 just because there's some guys that have some consistency in this league. But you got to win. 
That that's the thing. You got to, and then guys want to move up too. I was going to say, and if you win, it's a it's a double edged sword. You got to win, and if you do win, then somebody else will want you. Somebody else right. wants to pay you more. Yep. And then you've got the movement of guys that, if you're successful, I mean, look at Jeremy Garrett. I think he would if if he was going to be in college, he'd be at Auburn. But opportunities and the pros come up. Yeah. And look, I cannot blame a guy for taking a little more money and going to the NFL where I do not have to recruit. Where a lot more time with your family. Yeah. Look, I, it during, used to not be this way. See, college used to be very, you know, um, coveted. Yeah. Because you didn't have to recruit 24 7. No. You didn't have the transfer portal. You didn't have guys transferring and uh, these year round visits and, you know, our summer visits. Everybody took their official visits in the fall and in January. And then they had a signing day in February. And then you had a couple of months off and you had basically off until the summer when you had camps. You had camps in June. I, it was, I asked it was, that question. I asked that four. question to say nine months. I know y'all get tired of us saying that and where we're at right now. And it's like a broken record. And you're like, oh, I don't care. People are getting commitments right now. A lot changes in nine months. Nine months is a long time to hold a position coaching job these 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 days. Oh, I forgot we were talking about coaching jobs. Yeah. No, you're yeah. absolutely. I mean, think. All right. What's the likelihood? Billy Napier and his whole staff are at Florida this time next year. I don't know. You know what I mean? It's all going to be not not great. Yeah, <laughs> not not good at all. They play like what eight top twenty teams from last year. It is arguably no. the hardest schedule I have ever seen in the last. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, it, it, like you're out of conference games are Miami, USF, or UCF, and Florida State. Yeah. Who does that? Who schedules three teams that are all bowl teams as your non-conference schedule? But that I mean that's besides the point. But that's one. Uh, who else is potentially? Just look at look at Auburn's staff. Look how much look how much has changed in three months. There's a new. There, first of all, there's a, there's the same offensive line coach, the same tight ends coach. Hey, look at you. Same wide receivers coach, mm -hmm. different quarterbacks coach, different running backs coach, different D line coach, different edge coach, different linebackers coach, different safeties coach. And, and and crime dog was gone, so he, he was he was gone for the last half of the season, and he came back. So there's a different cornerbacks coach. I don't even know how many that is. I think that's the whole defensive side of the ball is different. Yeah. So you kept Aldridge. You kept. He's, he's moved. Yeah, he's so, moved. So, so but your he's, linebacker coach is different. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, the same guys are here. Same staff. So Jake Thornton's still here. Uh, Marcus Davis is still here. Ben Agamai is still here. Angamoa. Angamoa, okay. Angamoa, Angamoa, okay. Angamoa, we got. Right, I'm on, ben, I'm on practice. <laughs> we quartered him. him. We were like, "How do you?" Yeah, yeah. Say his, say your like, Ag Ag Agamaya. He's like, "No." The I G in Polynesian is an N, so it's Inga. So it's Angamoa. Angamoa, okay. I'll mess that up before the next time, but I promise you, I'm on practice. But 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 even even Aldridge. Changing okay, what did that do to Eric Winters? And Eric Winters changing positions now. Aldridge is the edge coach, and now Robert Kelly, the new guy's coming in, and you've got DJ Durkin at linebacker. Yeah, and they've got they've got a different style of linebacker that they want in this scheme. So, I asked that question. We were taking a poll the other day, and I think um, position coach might have, did it win for us. I don't remember of the things that were the number one thing. I know a lot of people on the corner have talked about this and said. Well, they're committing the position coaches, and I think they are. I think and the relationships if, were hot. Were, were was our number one, wasn't it? No, nil was number one. I know, but besides that, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Besides relationships NIL. were two, uh, and then it was uh, NFL development three. Playing time four, proximity to home. Yeah, nil yeah. was number one, definitely. Uh, but I knew something in my mind. I was I couldn't formulate it when we were talking about it last time, but. I got to thinking about this position coach thing and, and yes, you, you definitely want to be comfortable with a guy and you want to commit to a guy. But if I was giving advice, I'd say, guys, it's not personal. It's just business. They're going to move and they won't be there for your entire time. I don't know if that's the best factor to make a decision on. Now you need to have a good relationship and that matters as much as anything, in my opinion, but based on the entire decision on it, I just don't know. It's and they and they're listen. They're told this many, many times. Do not commit to a coach. Do not commit to a coach. But it's it's human nature, man. It's hard. It, it, yeah. 
Yeah. Like, like you can commit to that coach, but make sure you love everything about it so that if that guy leaves, which is very likely, you're still going to be happy. Definitely. And we all know we're sitting here as adults being able to say that. But when you're an 18 year old kid and you vibe with somebody and they understand and you're able to have a conversation and they're like a father figure or a big brother or whatever the situation is. It's so hard for those kids, man. It, it really is for them to, to not think of it as a business. It's, I mean, it's personal for them. They're committing to this person that's that's picked them, that's recruited them, that's scouted Texted them. them every day, called them every day, talked to their mom, built relationships, been in the home, been at games. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? That that's that's just you're right, Jeffrey. It is human nature for you to, even if you're told that, it just it goes to the periphery of your mind and you and you don't, it's not the focal point. Well, you, you think about a hot chick. Don't let her looks be the only thing, you know, to try to test out her character, her mind, her, you know, and man, you know, it doesn't matter. You know, we're looking past those that she's an idiot. But she's smoking freaking hot, dude. <laughs> you're at least gonna give her it's, a shot you know it's the it's the hot to crazy matrix you've seen that right? oh yeah <laughs> oh i'm gonna get myself in trouble i'm just gonna leave that one off man <laughs> so, I mean, but it's but it's hard to go you know what i don't want to date you even though you're smoking hot because yeah we may not be we, we may not click no man we're, we're gonna go out yeah we're gonna figure out we're gonna figure out if this is gonna work or not yeah right Right, right. Oh, go back go to the go back around the, them bases a couple of times. Right? <laughs> that reminds me of the uh, that reminds me of the Joe Phillips quote when he was just an up and coming guy, not with the ranking yet. He said Auburn's recruiting me like if I had a girlfriend who really want me. Yeah, mm. yeah that's right. It makes yeah. me it makes me want them more. <laughs> yeah. Oh man! All right, we got any more, Zach? Is that it? That's good it. deal. We had a great show, man. Some really great calls, and I liked the uh, the themes of our calls. I thought we were fantastic. Uh, let's see yep. here. Well, Stan got us call uh, got us started with his ex wife not knowing he wore socks in the bed. <laughs> Again, uh, how about Kevin? Second straight week, just coming in yep. hot, big dog. You know, great, mm -hmm. great uh, Bryce Kane question there. Something we'll continue to monitor. That question is a TBD for all of us. I think something to keep an eye on. I think Bryce Kane is. Uh, uh, a very good talking point for this off season. He's going to be, especially after the spring game. We'll see what happens there. Yep. Uh, An Anthony Montgomery, always fantastic. Dylan, and Alex, Eric, all these guys, man. Fantastic. Chappie. And then closing it off with, oh, hog bone. Yeah. Been a minute yeah. since he called in. Absolutely. Fantastic calls. Yeah. Uh, listen, before we go, uh, Jessica Andrews with the Talents Group. If you need a home in or around Auburn, Open, like I promise you, you will not be disappointed. If you are, call me and I'll call you a liar. Uh, give her a call, 334-704-4442. Tell her we sent you. She's a monster realtor, according to Alan Head. Or A-Head, just don't call him A-Hole. Mm, that's catching I, on, by the way. <laughs> is it, I think uh, Stan called you A-Head. No, he did. A-J A-Head? A-J Head. A-J Head. <laughs> -head. But, yeah. the, but the not A-Hole part is definitely started not to catch on. Not A-Hole. <laughs> Any, anything but A-Hole now. Anything but J-Head and A-Hole. There you go. We will accept. And, and, and Zach owes you $1.25 from yeah. tonight. We're good, man. All right. That, that last uh, slip-up was just $0.25. Cent. That's all okay. Right. Yeah. So we're uh, the jar head is up to twelve seventy five. That's it. No, let's take Zach's out of there because I owe him at least $5 from every time he had to edit the recruiting show from where I had him. You know what I mean? <laughs> You, yeah, you're cussing and stuff. Yeah, man. Jeffrey, you <laughs> might owe him money for calling him Zach Mackinall. <laughs> oh, I got to go back and tally it up. Dude, listen. So, I mean, I'm just kidding with you, but the other day when we were doing Maurice Harris, yeah, I had to like stop and go, McKinnell. I don't know if you caught that, but in my it took like a half a second to do it. But in my mind, I was like Zach, uh, and I thought I can't mess it. I can't. I can't tease him here on yeah, this I can't show. Go like, this, yeah, this is a serious business here. Um, all right, good stuff, man. Uh, we will be back Wednesday. Man, we're gonna have a lot of recruiting. We're gonna go really Gosh. in depth on this recruiting. Yeah. Uh, commitments, uh, potential commitments coming up. I think the next seven days, seven to ten days. Cole's prediction of multiple commitments in the month of month of month the month of March <laughs> could come to fruition. Yes. Auburn's got a lot of momentum coming out of this weekend, and yep. don't forget. Uh, Usan Longstreet, the four-star quarterback, top five quarterback, top seven quarterback in the country is coming in this uh, this coming up weekend. 
Um, so, uh, and a couple of more guys we're going to be keeping close eyes on. Uh, so a lot to talk about recruiting wise. We'll get to that Wednesday afternoon, check the corner Tuesday afternoon, evening. If you want to get a question in, we'll answer it on the recruiting show. And uh, if not, we'll have the, uh, the show out Wednesday morning. Uh, thanks again, once again, for everybody calling in, all the people in the chat. We appreciate you. We could not do this without you. Look for us Wednesday and then again back Sunday night. We will be back for another call-in show. For Alan Head, for Zach in the back who came to the front, for Cole Pinkston, I'm Jeffrey Lee. Man, y'all stay at that left lane. See ya. <laughs>